Welcome to Zelda Zelda Gaming. My name is Lachlan Linton Keen, and in today's scenery tutorial, we're diving headfirst into the Red Planet. Whether it's Geonosis in Star Wars Legion or the dusty plains of Mars in the 41st millennium, today's tutorial is going to look at a highly realistic gaming board that is large, really modular, that has a lot of flexibility, replayability, but also an incredibly high quality of scenic finish so that we can fully transport our tabletop experience to the dusty plains of Mars and the towering spires of Geonosis. Geonosis. In today's tutorial, we'll cover the full journey of creation from design and construction right through to painting and finishing, and we'll also dive deep on a few advanced techniques like leopard spotting, modularity of design, and extremely realistic finishing. So without further ado, let's begin our work on Mars and Geonosis. <laughs> As always, we need to start with a really strong foundation for our gaming board, and that begins with the timber base. I'm going to grab myself a half inch sheet of plywood and cut that into six two by two foot panels. These panels will then be able to be moved around to reconfigure our six by four foot gaming board. Once those panels are all cut and given a bit of a sand to make sure that there's no splintering on any of the edges, I'm going to grab a one inch sheet of extruded polystyrene foam and glue those straight down and cut it to size. Now you want to make sure that you get a nice level of glue. I like to use PVA for my bonding, but it does have a long drying time, so I just tape that in place with a bit of masking tape so that I can keep on moving. Now, if you don't have plywood available, you can use any type of hardwood paneling, perhaps even a composite like MDF or Masonite. But if you're going to use MDF, make sure you get at least 10 mil thick because that will warp over time. So now that those six boards are completed, we've got our foundation and it's time to dive into the conceptual element of our design and that's to work on our modular components. Now each of these panels is free moving and able to be repositioned with any other components in the board. So what we want to do is design some permanent features that are built into these boards, some, some rocks, some cliff faces, some escarpments, some outcrops, something that we can really kind of flavor and really scenically detail and build into the landscape. So it looks highly realistic, but we want to build it in such a way that they can be repositioned by moving the different panels. So I'm going to go for a kind of big central outcrop that runs from one long edge to the other at this point in time across the center of the board, smack bang in the middle of those two central panels. Now obviously that's a, a very kind of static, uh, big rocky emplacement uh, that is going to very much facilitate one style of gameplay. But I want to be able to move those squares and position them in different ways. So I'm going to add a couple of extra rocky outcrops to some of these other panels so that I can take these panels aside and join the shorter rocky outcrops to make a whole new landform on different sides of the boards. And this way we should get a whole lot of different configurations between these six panels which make for some very different play experiences. The best way to approach your specific design is to just get out a sketch pad and start having a look at what kind of things you'd like to appear, look at some reference material of the locations that you're creating. I drew heavily on the rocky formations from Star Wars Battlefront 2, the crap one, not the old one, but it did have some some really gorgeous locations and map designs. I mean, yeah, DICE know how to build a map, don't they? It's some stunning landscapes. So I looked at those rocky outcrops and, and kind of balanced that versus the mechanics of the game and the campaign that we wanted to play and then used that as my starting point and built off from there. Once you've got a mock-up or an idea, jump onto your big 6x4 foot panels and do a bit of a sketch over the top of those panels and start to work out where cliffs want to be, where rocks want to be, and make sure that anytime you're crossing one of those board edges, you keep the joins about the same size so that the panels can be swapped in and still marry up. Once you've sketched the cliff layout onto the panels, it's time to start blocking out those cliffs in real space. So I'm going to grab a couple of extra sheets of polystyrene foam, starting off with some 2-inch, and cut those down to size, give them a bit of a rough contour following that sketch that I've now put down onto the panel. These aren't going to be the finished rock faces, we're going to be detailing these heavily with some rock moulds. These are just to block out that landform which we'll then detail later on. So make sure you build them a little smaller than you want the finished cliff to be. If you have any cliff sections with varying heights, some taller escarpments, start to mock these up as well by using some thinner sheets or layering different sheets of 2 inch to get different bits of height. And uh, you can start to kind of uh, accentuate any curves or any gradients if you're going to have a ramp up to your rocky cliffs. Start to cut that out now and just give the, the hint of the overall shape of the landform. We're going to come in later and smooth this all over with putty and compound so it's lovely and natural and organic. But uh, any kind of work that you can do here to just generalize the slopes of these various cliffs is going to save you on modeling compound further down the track. 
And now we can see that my rocky outcropping is starting to take shape. We can get a bit of an idea of the different contours of the various rock faces, but now it's time to bring in the detail. For this and the rock faces themselves, we're gonna be using rock molds. Now there's a whole load of different companies that produce rock molds. They're essentially a vulcanized rubber mold that you pour plaster into and then peel the mold away to have an incredibly detailed rocky surface. We'll even be selling some rock molds on Zorpazorp.com very soon through the Geek Gaming scene range which is super exciting. Regardless of the brand that you use the general process is the same. Mix up your plaster, pour it into the mold and you'll end up with an absolutely stunning rock feature that looks like it was plucked just out of nature itself. It doesn't matter what brand of plaster you use, if you use a cheaper kind of plaster of Paris the plaster will be less durable and may chip or break so I like to use something called Hydrostone which is a really high tensile strength plaster but the plaster is a little less absorbent which creates a couple of tricks when you're painting but we'll come to that in a sec. So I'm mixing this plaster up. It's got a specific uh, water plaster ratio of 100 grams of plaster to 32 grams of water, but mix as per your custom plaster mix that you're using. You want to get the consistency to a nice enough slurry that it's not completely runny and it's not gritty or gloopy either and has enough viscosity to flow properly into the mold. Pour that into your mold and uh, wait for it to dry and you can crack it off and you've got yourself a wonderful mold piece. Now my biggest, biggest, biggest tip when using these rock molds is don't just make 100% mold casts. What you want to do is grab a little bit of plaster, pour into the bigger molds and just leave small pieces. Lots of small rock faces are more usable than big massive molds. I find that a lot of the time I smash all my molds up to make them fit anyway, so creating lots of little small or medium sized rock faces is going to be much more useful to you. It allows you to stop really obvious repetition when you're building large rock faces and reusing different molds and it also gives you more flexibility when doing curved or angled rock surfaces. When you're demolding your cast, make sure that you're not putting all of the pressure on the vulcanized mold itself. As soon as you can grab purchase on that rock element, they're very strong, they're not going to break in your fingers. Just securely grip and then try and peel those out. If you do put too much pressure on the vulcanized rubber molds, over time that stress will start to crack the mold. So try and take care of your molds and gently pry the caster plasts out. Once you've spent a couple of hours casting away and you've got a good collection of rock molds of various shapes and sizes, we can start to assemble our rock faces onto our foam escarpment. Now you'll find that this is quite an enjoyable process, planning all of the various rock forms and kind of getting an idea of the different textures and, and kind of positions and shapes that you've got on those rocks and you're gonna be able to create some really special stuff. It might look a little bit discontinuous when you're just lining them all next to each other, sitting on the pieces of foam. How is this gonna look realistic? Well, don't worry. They will all blend together seamlessly to look like an incredibly cohesive, realistic rock face. If your rock feature is gonna have any extra height, now's the time to bring in a few extra chunks of foam to really bulk out that landscape and give you something to glue your rock molds to. Once you've got them all kind of laid out and sort of in general planned where they're gonna go, it's time to start affixing them to our foam structure. Now we are gonna use some high bond PVA because in the long run, we want a really nice bond from these rock molds directly to the foam. But what we're also gonna do is just use a bit of hot glue just so that we can get an immediate tack so that the rock molds will hold there but you have to be careful because if you put brand new hot glue straight out of the glue gun onto extruder polystyrene foam you will melt it so I put a bit of PVA down on my rock mold put some hot glue down in the center and then I blow on it for five or so seconds just to cool it down enough so it's still tacky but it's not really hot and then push that firmly up to the polystyrene and the mold will stay there for the time being and then overnight by the time you've come back to the board tomorrow all of the rock molds will have super strong bonds from that PVA. But the hot glue allows us to keep on working for the moment. So work your way along the rocky outcrop, tacking all of your various rock features in place with the hot glue PVA combination. You don't have to worry too much about mixing up different types of molds, even if they don't feel particularly congruent, uh, because of course, rock isn't completely uniform in nature. There are all sorts of different types of rock coming together, so you can really jam different rock molds right up against each other, and we'll blend them all together to look supernatural in just a second. The rock faces are really coming together. We've got two very obvious kind of features, the big bastion of stone on the right, and that promontory that juts out on the left there with some highly detailed elements that are gonna be fantastic for gameplay. But now it's time to blend all those rock molds together and get that rock face looking incredibly realistic.
To do that, we're going to be using some Geek Gaming modeling compound that you can purchase from Zorbazorp.com. This is a powder, which is a plaster and cellulose fiber mix, and when you dilute it with a bit of water and mix it all up, it turns into a lovely paste, and you can smear that all over your rock molds and join them really seamlessly, but it also works as a beautiful filler to smooth out the landforms and get all of that foam blended together. So what we're going to do is mix this up in our mixing pot. It is three parts plaster to one part water, and you want to give that a good mix and don't mix in a really large volume because this stuff is fantastic. It dries really quickly. Within about sort of five minutes, it starts going a little firm and you can start to really shape it. And within 15 minutes, it's so dry that you can start to sculpt into it and kind of texture the surface and then it will be fully cooked off not long later. So the consistency you're looking for is a little bit like gloopy porridge. It shouldn't be running through your fingers. It should be holding its own form and quite sticky. And we're gonna take that compound and jam it literally every Everywhere. In all the gaps between the rock molds, just push that compound in, smooth it out so that you can't see any more of the foam. Anywhere you want to accentuate a slope or create a little rise, you can just pat down a whole load of compound, particularly on these ramps that I've got coming down either side of that central escarpment. Jam a whole bunch of compound there and smooth out all of those joints until it looks like a really natural landform. The fantastic thing about this plaster mix and rock molds is that it's all the same plaster components. It's essentially Essentially, just like the same materials, which means it's going to paint up exactly the same and we can get an identical finish. Now, about sort of five to ten minutes in, you'll start to notice that it goes a little kind of hard. And what you can do is just wet your fingers or wet your modeling tool and sort of smooth over the edges of it so you don't get any kind of pointy or, or kind of unnatural sections that are going to go dry and crumbly. You can smooth it all out and get it looking really natural as it dries through that period. And then about five to ten minutes later, once it's really really started to firm up, I come in with my sculpting tool and anywhere that's like a, a join between rock forms, if I've got like sort of a large gap between two rock molds and now I've got that all filled with modeling compound, I'll come in and I'll, I'll start to even texture a little bit of rock surface into that gap. Because it's plaster, I mean it is quite large fibers, so you can't do really fine detail sculpting, but you can create enough of a rocky texture that you cannot tell the difference between the rock molds and the compound that is joining those two rock molds. It's absolutely game-changing stuff. I love modeling compound. My number one recommendation to people who are kind of wanting to shake up their terrain making game is get modeling compound. You can create incredibly realistic landforms without ever having to pick up a piece of sandpaper and sand your polystyrene. It's absolutely awesome. Once you've got your compound all over the slope in the joins between the rock molds and especially jammed up underneath the rock molds to kind of blend those down into the ground around, you should have a fantastic looking rocky outcrop which is just really starting to come to life. So that is the bulk of our landforms created. And as you can see, I've made another two small rocky features on my two other panels, and we can combine these into quite a lot of different combinations. Obviously, there's the kind of main combination that I plan for with my big central rocky outcrop, but then by simply switching these panels up, I can get rock outcrops in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So there is a lot of replayability built into this board, and that's just the board itself. Once we start changing up all of the scatter terrain, the board is going to look very different every single game. But now it's time to just do the last of our little landform work on these flat surfaces. We've got some really nice natural landforms uh, on the rocky outcrops, and we just want to create a little bit of undulation on our flat foam panels, but we don't want it to get too kind of crazy by digging a massive valley out of it, because that will stop us putting down scatter terrain. So I'm just going to bring in a heat gun. You can also use a butane torch. Uh, I just like to use my heat gun because it creates less fume, uh, and we want to sort of gently melt a lot of the foam, just a little bit so that it's got a little bit of rise and fall and it doesn't seem completely perfectly flat. Now once that's done, we're going to grab ourselves some stone finished texture paint and start to apply some grit all over the board. Now this is just an acrylic paint mix that I get from the hardware store that has some stone and sand already mixed through it to create a nice rough finish. And this is the beginning of us laying our texture down all over our board. This is going to be the foundation of our Marsy Geonosis sandy surface. 
So you want to apply that all over the foam surfaces, but also over the top of the rocky outcroppings. Don't get it on any of the actual rock molds themselves. Basically, anywhere that you want grit, anywhere where sand would actually form is where we want to put down the textured paint. But anywhere that would be exposed rock face, we want to leave that as just the plaster rock mold. Now you can see I've got that down there all over the board, and I actually decided that the flat sections were still looking a little too flat. I wanted them to have a little more variety. Variety. So I grabbed myself a big blade and started cutting a few extra chunks, just sort of three, four, five mil cuts into the surface just to break it up a little bit and then came back and textured painted those as well, just so that it wasn't completely flat and to give a little bit more of a kind of mini rocky outcrop feeling to make the big rocks uh, kind of blended with that surface. And that's still going to allow me to put scatter terrain down, but it's just going to add a little bit of visual detail that kind of really fills out the eye. And now once we've got that all done, it's time to get down our prime and we're ready to crack on into painting. I'm going to be spraying all of these regions that have the textured paint with a brown primer. This is a foam safe primer, uh, which is incredibly important to use. It's a floral spray paint and it's not a traditional spray paint, so it's not going to melt any of your exposed foam. The key here, however, is we do not want to prime the rock molds. I'm using a cardboard piece there to protect the rock molds. We do not want paint on those rock molds. We want to paint directly onto that plaster so we can utilize the absorbent properties of the plaster to create an absolutely stunning finish. So use your spray can really sparingly near the rock molds. Once that prime is down, we're going to start painting our rock molds. Now we're going to be using a technique here called leopard spotting. Now this is a technique that's been used in the kind of uh, wargaming and scenery community for a long, long time to create really realistic looking rocks by bringing in essentially color. So the way that we do this is we paint up our rock molds with a whole lot of washes, a series of washes that layer together to create a highly realistic effect. The first thing we're going to do is prepare our pigments. Now I'm going to be using four washes today. There's a yellow ochre, a sandy orange, a pretty deep dull red, and then a brownie red oxide. Now these washes are super easy to mix and super cheap to make. We're just going to use uh, essentially craft paints from the craft store and dilute them in water. What you want to do is grab yourself a cup and squirt five to ten mil you know, a quarter of an inch of paint into the bottom of that cup and then pour about four times as much water and then really stir the crap out of it. Once you've mixed it all up, you can test the pigment on the side of the uh, of the cup there and you can see how thick or how dark it is. You want to have enough saturation of color that the pigment holds to the side of the cup as it runs down uh, and you can sort of see the color a bit before it all rejoins with the rest of the paint body. So to begin leopard spotting these cliffs, we're going to create a series of undertones using our brighter colors. And then we're going to overtone those and tone them all together and back with another series of washes. First up is going to be our yellow ochre. Now what we want to do is just kind of load up our brush with the yellow ochre and then put it at the top of the rock and release all of the pigment and let that yellow flow down the rock surface naturally, coloring and staining the plaster as we go. Now as you do this process, you'll see the true beauty of the modeling compound because the modeling compound is made from plaster. It's the exact same component as the rock molds. As the paint is coloring these surfaces, the transition between the plaster rock molds and the plaster cellulose modeling compound is completely seamless and it all just looks like rock that's taking and absorbing paint in the same way. So you want to be dotting this yellow all over the rock, sort of about 25 to 30% of the total rock face. And then once that's done, we're going to come back and do the exact same thing to the orange. Now you're not like sort of letting these layers dry, just go straight into it because if these layers are a little bit sort of wet in between, that way you get a nice kind of bleed or blend between the different colors. You can let the orange run over the yellow, let it all kind of go together in different regions because you get kind of really nice graduated tones. So the same thing, sort of like another 25 to 30% of that orange all over the rock face. And then we're going to do the same thing with the red. Now the red is the darkest so far of the colors and you'll see that it can be quite a stark look compared to the first two. So you can use it over the top of the red, uh, of the yellow and orange, sorry, and you can also uh, give it some space on its own straight into plaster to create some darker regions. So dot that into the top, let the ink kind of run everywhere, and uh, and you should have almost all of it, sort of like 85% of the rock mold covered by the end of the red layer. Now we're going to bring in our final color in this pre-shading stage, which is the red oxide. Now this is going to be our primary 
finished color, but we want some of this to be on pure white as well. So anywhere left you have plaster, anywhere that hasn't got uh, kind of pigment that's run over it from putting down the other leopard spots, just put that sort of red oxide brownie color all over that white plaster so you have no white plaster left. Don't worry if it feels like this rock surface is looking way too bright. These are our undertones which we are about to darken down. Now once you've got that surface completely covered and there's no more white but you've got all your beautiful undertones, we want to let this dry. I actually like to grab my heat gun and kind of cook it off a little bit. It really sets the color in and it also speeds up the drying time. And then once that has dried, we're going to come back with our red oxide and recover the entire rock face. Now I actually did this a couple of times on each of my rock surfaces to really deepen the red and darken it up and create a nice brown overtone which sort of pushed it into that dark Geonosis Mars rock face that I really like. Now that our rock faces are pretty much done, it's time to start undertoning our actual ground surface. We're going to be doing that by grabbing some of the red oxide straight paint that we use to mix the wash and just kind of overbrushing that all over our dark brown prime. Now you want to be getting a reasonably thick coat here, but don't be alarmed if you can still see a fair bit of that brown through the surface. We're just creating an undertoning here because we're going to be putting down some absolutely stunning sand and gravel to make this really come alive. We just want to do a general toning here. Then we're going to do the exact same technique using raw ochre, or it's it's sort of like a, a yellow ochre color, but a little bit sandier. Uh, and what we're going to do here is, is load this up on our brush and then take a little bit of it off on the palette because it is a bit of a brighter color and we don't want to accidentally create any obvious brush strokes. But again, subtlety is not a huge issue in this layer because we're creating undertones. So dry brush that all over the board. Once again, a nice coverage and we're starting to really elevate that brown into a nice sandy tone which is starting to match those rock molds. Then as a final note, we're just going to grab some of that raw ochre and some white paint and mix those together. We're going to create a, a nice kind of final highlight uh, which is going to look absolutely awesome and make the very tops of all of our ground surface pop. When you load this one up onto your brush, you want to take a lot of that paint off in a traditional dry brushing style, really pull it off onto some paper towel or blotting paper, and then we want to highlight all of the top areas like the sun is hitting the tops of the sand. Uh, you've got all of the kind of little raised creases around where we've dug out different bits of stone with our knife. There's all the blends between the rock molds uh, and the ground surface and across the top of those rocky escarpments as well. If you give those a bit of a dry brush, it really helps blend the rock molds with the sand and, and ground texture. And if you wanted to, you could just leave the board there and you could call it done. But for those of you who uh, have been familiar with my builds and this channel, uh, leaving things okay and pretty good is not really how we fly around here. So we are going to jump into sort of the final phase of this board, which just takes it to the absolute next level and makes it look absolutely amazing. And we're going to do that by using the base ready product from Geek Gaming, Mars Earth. Now Mars Earth is an amazing, amazing product. If you guys have watched my Star Wars Legion tutorials, you know how much I love it for basing my Geonosis clones and droids. You can get it from me over at ZorbaZorb.com. So if you want to support the channel and love what I'm doing, feel free to buy it through us. That would be absolutely amazing. It's just a phenomenal product. It's a mix of uh, grouts and modeling sands and aggregates and pigments that all tie together into this wonderful blend that just looks amazing for Mars or Geonosis or any kind of red sci-fi landscape. Even like a desert landscape as well for some Kandish forces for Middle Earth. Lots of awesome uses for it. Now what we're going to do uh, if we've got Mars Earth is we're actually going to separate it into its constituent elements by sieving out the larger aggregates. So we've got a little bit more control where our gravel components goes and where our really thin sand base goes because we don't, don't want too many large gravel chunks on the large flat planes because that's going to get in the way of putting down our scatter terrain. So I'm just going to grab a sieve and separate those two components and then we're ready to go. Now the first thing we're going to do is uh, create a varnish mix. Now this is just your kind of classic uh, sort of ceiling PVA mix. It's a big chunk of PVA. I sort of put like a centimeter or three quarters of an inch uh, in the bottom of a cup and then the same again of matte acrylic varnish. Uh, now a lot of people get really wigged out when they're mixing up diluted PVA varnish mixtures. Basically as long as you've got a varnish that's white and it says acrylic you're going to be fine. Don't use like a, um, a urethane uh, timber varnish that's oily and yellow. Give that a really good mix and then you've got your PVA varnish sealing solution. The reason we add the varnish in is it's just an extra binding element that's really going to lock down all of these basing supplies and 
and make sure that this gaming surface is super, super tough. I'm going to apply that all over the board. I'm talking all over the tops of the rock molds, all over the flat surfaces, in underneath the rock molds, and just get a nice coverage of that varnish mix everywhere. Uh, and then what we're going to do to start with is grab our large aggregate. Grab all the little rocks of different sizes. We want to scatter them all over the top of the rock molds, all over the, the top of the rocky outcrops, particularly underneath at the bottom around the rock molds. That really helps to kind of blend the cliff faces with the planes, because of course little chunks of rock would be falling off those rocks and collecting at the bottom. So kind of pile those all up as well. And you might be thinking, geez, I've got these massive chunks of rock. How are they going to be held down by this little gluey varnish mix? But trust me, most of them will hold. And of course, if they don't hold, it doesn't matter because you've already painted the underneath surface. Uh, so you, they will bind in there. And then once you've got, you know, the right kind of mix and you're happy, what we're going to do is start applying our Mars Earth sand component. So what I do is I grab my sifter and I grab a handful of it and just gently drop it into my my sifter and rock my hands back and forth, shaking the sifter out over the flat surface. If you just apply it from your hand, you're going to drop it in massive clumps and it's very difficult to control, whereas putting it through the sifter or a sieve uh, will allow you to really kind of shake it out and get a nice even coverage. Now you pretty much want to put it everywhere, but it doesn't matter if you miss a little bit because of course underneath you've already got the grit of the textured paint and that pre-coloured surface. So it doesn't matter if some areas are heavy and some areas are light, that'll just create a little bit of natural variation. Now you might be looking at this going, oh my god, that is going to use a lot of Mars Earth, but I think for this entire 6x4 board, I used four to five bags of the base ready mix and that also based my entire collection of legion all my clones all my troopers which is two core boxes worth you know it's like I don't know, 60 or 70 models probably, and this board from five, we'll say five bags to be safe. Uh, so it actually goes really far when you sieve it out through the sieve because you get even coverage and don't accidentally pile up too much in that one space. Now what you want to do is just apply that all over your six panels and let that dry overnight. Let that varnish and that PVA really cook off and then once that's dry, we're going to come back with the exact same mixture and we're going to spray that on with a spray bottle when this acts as our ceiling spray. Now this is effectively any ceiling spray you ever buy. We also sell one on zorpazorp.com. It's called the Geek Gaming Sealant Spray. It's effectively just this mixture, but you can just make it yourself. And you can seal any terrain with this for with static grass, flocks. These are all your kind of the Woodland Scenic Seal and Spray. It's all just a bit of PVA, a bit of varnish, and mostly water. So make it yourself usually. And if you don't have the stuff, feel free to buy it from us. Uh, but we, uh, it's, it's just awesome. It will lock in that layer. There's the kind of underneath layer of varnish that's held it all in. And then this gets in all over the top and seals down and absolutely locks it down tight. Now you sort of will think, oh God, I'm putting white spray glue all over it. It doesn't matter. Once the PVA and the matte varnish dry, uh, you won't even notice that the glue's there and you'll see all the beautiful sand underneath. So then we have the main body of our sand done and the board is so, so close. Once again, if you really like that deep red look, you could leave the board here, but I like to just bring it a little bit more into the orange of Geonosis uh, and really kind of blend it a little bit lighter to make it match that cliff face and look even more realistic. So what we're going to do is just grab our raw ochre that we used before, and we're going to do a little bit of a dry brush, a nice gentle dry brush over all of the Mars Earth surface, including the aggregate, including all the little rocks, just dry brush the whole board, and that really lifts the Mars Earth. Earth, the beautiful red of the Mars Earth forms that really lovely undertone and most of your mid-tones uh, and then you get a nice kick off the top with the raw oxide and then we're going to do the exact same thing again using the 50-50 raw oxide white blend that we dry brush the first surface with uh, and then we're going to do the same thing again where we just hit the very tops of the surface picking out the highlights picking out the top of the ridges and the crests and the little collections of rock as if the sun is hitting the top of this sand and creating a nice natural highlight to make that scene and then we have a fully complete stunning looking sandy geonosis mars surface and i think you'll agree that the color palette just looks amazing i am so like blown away by how good this board looks on the table. I get super excited whenever we're playing with it. And I think it looks, I, I mean, I hope you guys like it, but I, I think it looks really, really cool. Now we've just covered sort of the assembly and the, and the painting of, of this one sort of square. Now here you can see 
all six of them together. And I thought I'd just do a little run through all of the different variations that you can create with this board because there are quite a few. And this is where just a little bit of thinking in your pre-design process, a little bit of uh, kind of thought into modularity means that you haven't gone into all the effort of building this six by four board to have one gaming setup. And I think that's what puts a lot of people off building a really big board like this is that, oh, well, I'm gonna do all that effort and then I'm gonna get bored after it, bored of it after one game. And I, that's, if, if you can just, you know, design your little two by two tiles in such a way that you can reposition them to give you completely different games gaming experiences with just a little bit of thought at the beginning and a little bit of kind of doing some math and, and making joins kind of the similar size so you can swap bits and pieces, you get yourself an absolutely fantastic uh, d sort of diverse gaming experience that's going to last you long into the future. So there we have it guys, I am stoked with how this has turned out. Our Mars slash Geonosis gaming board, uh, I think we've achieved a really high level of finish. I'm super excited about how realistic the rock work is, how it blends with all of the earth and space. I think it's just an awesome gaming board. And as you can see, we're in Geonosis mode at the moment because we're halfway through filming uh, the first installment of our new Star Wars Legion narrative campaign and it is a joy to play on. I absolutely love it. I really love how configurable it is as well. If I ripped off all this scatter terrain and threw down some Mechanica stuff, mixed up all of the plates, we'd have a completely different board in a wonderful setting for 40k. So I love sort of building boards that can do multiple things, right? It's really kind of diverse. It means that when you spend a lot of time and money building a big board, you've got to get as much out of it as you can. So I think this board is a perfect sort of showcase of that style of build. If you guys have enjoyed that, make sure you uh, stick around. We're going to be unloading a couple more tutorials in this vein. Obviously, we haven't dived into any of the scatter terrain. You can see there's some gorgeous Geonosis stuff down here. So we're going to be looking at more in depth of that. And we might do some Mechanica stuff as well to really show what you can do with this board and, and sort to take it to the next level. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to let us know in the comments. Subscribe if you're new around here and always drop the video a like. If you want to kind of help support us so that we can do more board builds like this, feel free to head on over to our Patreon and check out the rewards. We've got some pretty cool stuff over there. But thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time right here on Zorba Zorb Gaming. Cheers, guys. Also, just a quick shout out to the Warhammer Mount Gravatt team here in Brisbane for letting us borrow their store models and terrain to fully deck out our Mechanicus board so that we could truly see what Mars would look like.